Listen now for the word of God to Isaiah and to all of us. Shout out. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. They say, why do we fast, but you do not see? Why do we humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? A day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down, to lie down in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn. Then your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. And the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and God will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called repairer of the breach, restorer of streets to live in. This is the word of the Lord. We live, do we not, in an age of brevity. Long gone, it seems, are the meandering conversations on front porches in the cool of the evening. Gone even, it seems, are the front porches themselves. In the marketing world, advertisers use fast-paced images and only a few choice words to promote products in a, in a matter of the seconds available to them before you are allowed to skip the ad by clicking a button. In the political sphere, we, we rely increasingly on soundbite news clips to form opinions and influence outcomes. Even in our interpersonal and social relationships, loquacious verbosity, that's a lot of words, has been upended by the character limits of Twitter and text messaging. Do you ever look at your voicemail and, and see that the message is, I don't know, three or four minutes long, and then find yourself scrolling to the end of the message, hoping to get to the important parts, or maybe listening to it on double speed to get there more quickly? I'm guilty of that. 
In this age of brevity, persistent messages from a variety of seemingly endless sources compete for one prized second of our shrinking attention spans. Only the most creative and memorable or shocking and disturbing tend to break through. The challenge we all face as the pace quickens and attention spans contract is sifting through the babble, prioritizing the voices, weighing the options, and distinguishing between truth and falsehood, between meaningful speech and mindless prattle. This, it seems to me, is is one good reason to come to worship on a weekly basis. To clear our hearts and minds of the junk messages that clutter them. And focus instead on the words that inspire. Words like hope and grace and love. I am convinced that if words ever mattered at all, then they matter more now than ever in the age of brevity. Perhaps you've heard of the public relations and advertising technique tailor-made for this age of brevity known as the elevator speech. In a column for Business Week titled, The Perfect Elevator Speech, Eileen Pincus writes that an elevator speech should, quote, sum up unique aspects of your product or service in a way that excites others, and as the name suggests, that speech ought to be brief enough to share in the time it takes for an elevator to move from one floor to the next. A matter of seconds. Oh, we do live in the age of brevity. The more personal version of the elevator speech is what the author and speaker Simon Sinek describes as a why statement. He explains that the why is about your unique contribution to impact and serve others. The the why is what inspires you. In short, your why is your purpose. It it provides a, a clear, succinct answer to the question, why do I get out of bed in the morning? He concludes that strong why statements are key to long-lasting success and viability. As a congregation, we've been spending some time in recent months discussing the the unique aspects of who we are and what we're called to be and do. You might say that we've been asking the question, why does Second Presbyterian Church get out of bed in the morning? Now, our identity statement has the the qualities of an effective elevator speech and a persuasive why statement. We exist to be, say it with me, a, a welcoming community of faith where Jesus Christ transforms lives. Now, there's a lot of meaning packed in those few words. They provide enough why to keep us going for a long time. I think it's a helpful exercise, a a revealing exercise for all of us to ponder our why. Most of us spend a lot of time focused on what we do and how we do it. But why questions often seem too time-consuming or laborious for us to take on, and so we assume that we understand why we do what we do. But engaging in this exercise of pondering will help us clarify our vocation. It helps us focus our energy and determine our priorities. Those why statements also provide a kind of of north star to, to point those of us who are prone to wander back in the right direction when we veer off course. The words of this morning's scripture text provide a a beautiful case in point when it comes to wandering off course. Here's the context. 
The people of God have, have finally come home from exile in Babylon. They return to Judah and they reestablish their way of life. And, and for a time, they remember. They honor the God who has brought them out of Babylon with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. They are clear about their why. And they live out of that clear clarity and, and that conviction. But by the time the prophet speaks these words, the community has forgotten its why, lost sight of its core purpose. The consequence is that they have fallen into empty ritual. They go through the motions, but, but leave their faith at the door of the temple, and, and they've grown accustomed to this way of being a community, these acts of worship that exist only to display their holiness to the world. Things like fasting in public, so that everyone can see how holy they are all the while neglecting the needs of hungry people in their literal midst. They've fallen into worship with no real-world consequence, these ritual practices that do not evoke righteous living. The people of Judah are praying the prayers and they're singing the songs and they're making this, this grand spectacle of their religious customs inside the temple and then they are practicing injustice and hatred in the real world. They have forgotten the why of their belonging. And the prophet Isaiah can take it no longer. Speaking the word of the Lord to those who had become comfortable with superficial surface level religiosity, his words bring both a sober reality check and a captivating why statement. Why are you here to feed the hungry? free those held captive by oppression to house the homeless and clothe the naked, to build a community of faith empowered and compelled to serve the world. Isaiah's words this morning remind me of one of the great historic principles of our Reformed Presbyterian tradition. The election of the people of God for service as well as salvation that is, we are claimed by God, not just for eternal life with God, but for abundant lives of servanthood here on earth with God's people. That's why we're here. On Friday, I was having lunch with a member of the congregation, and he had asked about this week's sermon, and I was describing to him and explaining that I was having trouble making the, the why statement tangible in a way that was building on Isaiah's prophetic text. What more could I say, I asked the man, and he said, put it in a story. Here's one. While in seminary, I was fortunate enough to work for two years as the overnight host at Clifton Sanctuary Ministries, a homeless shelter for men. I confess that I had taken the job which consisted of staying at the shelter two nights a week for a very practical purpose. I needed to earn a little extra money as a student, but what I received was an encounter with a place where worship and mission meet, where praise of God joins compassionate acts of justice and mercy. To understand, you need to know how it all began. In the winter of 1979, a homeless man froze to death in the city of Atlanta. At the very same time, members of Clifton Presbyterian Church were in the midst of a Bible study. They were studying Isaiah, and, and after much prayer and preparation, the members of the congregation discerned that God was calling them not just to read the words of Isaiah, but to put them into practice, to live out the truth they proclaimed. And that November, they began a shelter in the church building. It was a startling decision. And it was also the first homeless shelter in the city of Atlanta. 
started by a group of people who took Scripture seriously enough to believe that it was written for them. Now, in 2003, Clifton Presbyterian Church, after years of dwindling membership in a changing neighborhood, closed. Except that's not true. The church was transformed into a shelter. Now the 30 men who stay there each night sleep in what was once the sanctuary. You see, the ministry of Christ in that church is as strong now as it ever was. The members of the congregation have joined other area churches and continue once a month to gather and serve at the shelter where they once worshipped. It was not the death of a church. It was the birth of a ministry. The, the pulpit remains centrally located in that sanctuary, and above it there is a mural, Hebrews 13.2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that some have entertained angels without knowing it. Maybe that's why we're here. Worship empowers us to live as God's bold people in and for the world, not apart from the world. Worship transforms us and empowers us, enables us to make a change in this broken creation. You see, if our worship inside these four walls does not impact our living outside of them, then we've missed the message entirely. Isaiah is very clear on this point. Worship should not just make us feel good, it should make us do good. Though the Hebrew phrase tikkun olam does not appear in Scripture, it has been used for centuries to describe the role of faith community. This Hebrew phrase tikkun olam literally means to repair the world. It was used by the rabbis in the first and second century to describe the role of the faith community. Repair the world. The concept of tikkun olam points to the notion that we who call ourselves faithful bear responsibility not only for our own moral, spiritual, and material welfare, but we are called to be repairers of the world, to seek the welfare of our society at large and especially those who find themselves in deepest need. Repairing the world. Now, if this call feels overwhelming or intimidating, good. That means you're beginning to grasp its meaning. You see, the work of compassion, the call to love, the ministry of peace, it's difficult in any age. But in this time of disconnection and division, in the age of brevity, it may be harder still. But the promise voiced by the prophet is true for us as well. Stop pointing fingers. Stop speaking evil. Offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of afflicted. And then, here's the promise, the Lord will guide you. God will satisfy your needs in parched places. God will make your bones strong. You will be like a watered garden. Isaiah says that God's people shall one day be called repairers of the breach. Restorers of the streets. What if that's why we're here? What if that was the marketed brand of the Christian movement? What if this was our elevator speech? We are followers of Jesus Christ. We repair what is broken. We restore the communities that have been ripped apart. 
Here's the thing, you're already doing it in in subtle and unheralded ways. I hear about it all the time, people finding those tears in the fabric of community and sewing them back together one stitch at a time. Restoring what has been destroyed one conversation at a time, one simple act of kindness at a time, to be a witness to the work of God's people repairing what is broken among us is perhaps the greatest gift of ministry. The ways in which you do this often take my breath away. Followers of God living out the call to repair and restore A few weeks ago, Sarah and I were walking on the Monon, and we passed by Broad Ripple Fit Club. Now, if you know about Broad Ripple Fit Club, then you know this. Whoever these people are, they are absolutely passionate evangelists for functional fitness. Spend a little time on their website and you will learn just how passionate they are. Testimony after testimony from those who use the Broad Ripple Fit Club. This is not a commercial for the Broad Ripple Fit Club. But what I want you to know is that outside their gym and strategically placed right there on the Monon, there is a banner, and that banner reads, we're looking for 15 people who want to change their lives. As we walked by, Sarah pointed at the banner and turned to me, and she said, Chris, we ought to have a sign like that outside of Second Presbyterian Church. We're looking for people who want to change their lives who want to change their community, who want to change the world. Second Presbyterian Church, we are here for the transformation, to be changed and to make change in God's broken, beautiful world. Try it out. Here at Second Presbyterian Church, we're looking for people who passionately believe that the love of God we know in Jesus Christ has transformed the world already and that it can again. We're looking for people who want to worship God and then get to work. We're looking for people who look at the world and see not only what is broken, but but lying before us the tools necessary to repair the breach. We are looking for people who lift voices and move feet and find purpose together. And here, my friends, is the gift. If we do that, we will be transformed. Our church will grow deep and wide Our lives will find meaning and purpose. Our community will be enriched. We will be changed as we join God's redemptive work. Our worship will be bolder, truer to the prophet's vision, and then our worship will do something to us and through us to the world beyond. The prophet Isaiah had a banner of his own. He lifted his voice in the midst of his community to proclaim the purpose of faith. We're looking for people who want to live God's compassion in the world. We're looking for people who know that their abundance is meant for those who lack enough. We're looking for people who understand God's mercy and welcome extends to all God's children. It looks like repairing what is broken. It looks like stitching up what has been torn apart. My brothers and sisters, that's why we're here. Amen.